Okay, we're going to get started. And a few more people will be floating in, but uh, we welcome everyone. And um, I want to just thank you all for coming. Uh, we're really delighted to have be kicking off this event tonight. Uh, my name is Ann Thrupp, and I'm the executive director of the Berkeley Food Institute. Uh, and um, we're on, on behalf of the organizers, I want to thank you all for coming and to welcome you here tonight. Um, we're really honored and delighted to be putting on this event to feature Marian Nessel's newest book on soda politics. Um, and this topic, of, as all you know, is incredibly important, and it's also particularly exciting for us here at Berkeley, um, and it's meaningful for many people who've been actively involved in the so-called soda wars and actually gaining victory, so yay. Um, I want to congratulate those of you who are involved in those efforts and also thank all of you, many of you who are involved in food movements and food activities in this whole um, community. Uh, we have so many people who are doing great work on promoting healthy beverages and good food and public education on public health um, and improving the agriculture and food system. So we just really want to thank you and encourage you for all of the activities that you're doing. So this um, event is sponsored by the Berkeley Food Institute, um, which many of you know serves as a hub and a connector here on the UC Berkeley campus. And we're implementing a number of programs, but particularly innovative research on food systems, as well as uh, public education activities and policy and community engagement programs as well. Um, all of those things are aimed towards transformative tra change or encouraging and catalyzing transformative change in food systems. So um, we're really excited, again, to be sponsoring this and many other events that are raising people's awareness and really helping to bring together people who are involved in these issues. The co-sponsors of this event uh, include the UC Nutrition Policy Institute and uh, UC Berkeley School of Public Health, UC Berkeley Health Matters Wellness Programs, the Ecology Center, and Oxford University Press. You want to, those representing those organizations want to raise your hands? Yay. Thank you. Thanks so much. We're, great to, we're so happy to be collaborating with people who are helping out on all these, these issues. Um, and for more information on BFI, the Berkeley Food Institute, please uh, you know, grab some information at our desk as you, as you go out today. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter to get on our, on, to learn about all the events and activities we're doing. And also, you can check us out on Twitter and Facebook. So, uh, with that, I'm going to leave it at the introductions, and I, but move on, and I'm very pleased to introduce Marion Standish, another important Marion this evening, and she's um, the Vice President and Inter of Enterprise Programs at the California Endowment, and she will be introducing Marion Nessel. Uh, I think we've decided that Marion is a very special name tonight, so <laughs> if there are more Marions in the audience, you are also honored. <laughs> um, so I just want to say a word about Marion Standish. She leads multiple philanthropic partnerships and provides strategic guidance to impact investing um, activities and serves as a lead officer for the California Endowment. She's involved in many initiatives. I won't even name them all, but they're really incredible. And she's been involved in many years in grant making that's helped to transform communities and reduce inequities and improve health. Um, she's played a key role in implementing Cal Endowment's Partnership for Public Health, Community Action to Smite, Fight Asthma, Healthy Eating Communities, and others. Um, and before joining the endowment, she was founder and director of the California Food Policy Advocates. So please help me w to welcome Marion Standish, who will introduce our other powerhouse, Marion. Thanks, Anne, and thanks for the opportunity to introduce the other Marion. Of course, that's why I was invited to do the introduction. Um, and Marion and I share a few things aside from our names. She's teaching at the university that I graduated from. Uh, she's living in the city I grew up in, and I'm here where she used to be. So we've kind of flipped roles in that way. But Really, I, when Ann called me and asked if I would um, say a few things and introduce Mary, and I really jumped at the opportunity. And while I have all her formal credentials, which I'm sure all of us are somewhat familiar with, I'm going to skip over them and just 
give you three reasons why I was so excited uh, to be able to introduce her and, and be part of this conversation this evening. First, I couldn't wait to hear Marion's straight-talking, hard-hitting analysis of the politics of soda. I think it's especially um, exciting because those of us living here in Berkeley or living in San Francisco is, experience that firsthand. So we have a lot uh, to talk about and share uh, in terms of the, polit the real politics of soda. Um, as the industry, I think, spent nearly $10 million to defeat the soda initiative in San Francisco alone. So uh, there is a lot of experience here in the room. Secondly, uh, Marion brings, from my point of view, the perfect blend of science. She's actually got a PhD in molecular biology. Uh, and understands nutrition, which is a pretty unique qualification in and of itself, uh, public health, and most importantly, activism to her work. And I think she has been a super motivator for all of us to stay in these uh, David and Goliath battles. And there have certainly been many of them, and this is one of the biggest. So um, I certainly appreciate her inspiration, if you will, uh, for staying in the fight. And third, because she is really a treasured member of our community, a mentor, a colleague, and represents us so well on what I consider the big stage. And it's not just the New York Times, which she's in there too, but she's really informing and influencing the national dialogue on food, on health, and on politics, and we certainly need it. So I appreciate Marion for all those reasons and welcome her. And we can read about all of her credentials in the book. So welcome, Marion. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Marion. Oh, it's just so nice to be here. It's, first of all, it feels like coming home, and this audience is full of old friends, students, teachers, um, people I've known for a long time and a short time, and it's wonderful of you to come. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I thought what I would do, uh, since this is official book launch, um, would be to talk a little bit about why I wrote this book, um, and then what I learned while I was doing it and then where I think all of this is going. So let me start with uh, where, uh, how it, it happened. Um, actually, my agent and one of her other clients suggested it, and it seemed like such a good idea to me because at NYU, I teach food policy and politics, and I teach food advocacy, and I couldn't think of anything that brought food, politics, and advocacy better uh, together together than did soda. Um, and when people wonder what soda has to do with politics, I can answer it in one picture. <laughs> There's your answer. So obviously it's extremely political, um, and it's political for a number of reasons. Uh, the soda industry is highly concentrated, and the two major companies who own most of the business are Coke and Pepsi. And they're international companies that advertise uh, all over the um, all over the world, and from a public health standpoint, and I know a lot of you are public health people here, um, sodas are low-hanging fruit. Um, and what that means is they're an easy target, they're sugars and water and have no nutrients, have no nutritional value whatsoever, what, whatsoever other than calories, um, and they're an easy target. The first thing you do if somebody is worried about their weight or their health is you tell them to stop drinking sugary drinks. So there was plenty to talk about there. The sugar issue is a really interesting one to me because in talking about the book and in working on the book, I still can't get my head around how much sugar there is in these drinks. You don't see it when it's going in. You don't realize it's there. Um, it's piles and piles and piles of sugar sugar cubes uh, to get in there. And finally, I learned to say it's five-sixths of a teaspoon per ounce. Um, 
call it a teaspoon and exaggerate a little bit. And this is why Center for Science and the Public Interest in the late 1990s published a report on liquid candy. And I thought that was a brilliant way of putting it. If you think of sodas as liquid candy, you think, okay, we really should, you wouldn't feed your kids candy all day long, or at least most of us wouldn't. Okay, Halloween. But, um, but you would certain, but people drink sodas all day long as a substitute for water and the sugar is invisible. You just don't know it's there. Well, I'm a nutritionist, and we have dietary guidelines, or at least we had dietary guidelines. Whether we're going to have them in 2015 is um, uh, pretty uncertain at this point. Um, but they're pretty clear, and they have been since 1980, about what they advise. They want you to eat more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and whole foods, and less of junk foods, sodas, snack foods um, and fast food. And that, of course, is not the way Americans eat. If you look at what the major sources of calories are in American diets, and for this slide you have to read um, in the Hebrew way from right to left, um, the number one source of calories, the main source of calories over the entire population is what the Department of Agriculture loves to call grain-based desserts. <laughs> and by that, they mean cakes, pies, cookies, uh, Pop-Tarts, donuts, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody eats those. That's why they're a big source of calories. Bread is second, fried chicken is third, and sweetened drinks are the fourth source of calories in America. American diets, pizza, pizza runs a close fifth. Oh yeah, and alcohol. Well, we don't talk about that one. Um, in any case, everybody lies. Um, the, the, other, the other reason for being really interested in sodas as something to write about is that their consumption in the United States is declining. And it's declining significantly. Um, so in uh, this curve goes from 1980 to, to the, the present day. And you can see that starting in the late 1990s, the consumption of total sodas and regular, regular mean sugar sweetened started going down. The average consumption in the United States is somewhere on the order of 10 or 12 ounces a day per capita, man, man, men, women, little tiny babies. But half the population doesn't drink sodas, so that means the half that does drinks twice as much. Um, and a lot of people drink really a lot of this stuff. So I've got these little thumbs up thing, because one of the themes of this talk is that we're winning. I went to a, the soda summit a year or so ago in Washington, and every single speaker, one after another after another, got up and said, we're winning. And these little thumbs up that you'll see on these slides are indications of where I think um, public health is winning. And we don't always get to talk about wins. I like talking about wins. Um, so, of course, the public health reason for discussing sodas has to do with obesity and its massive worldwide press, uh, prevalence. Um, this is a map that just came out of um, the worldwide distribution. The darker the color, the, highest, the higher the percentage of people who are overweight or obese. It's now roughly uh, two or three billion people. And then global soft drink consumption, it's not exactly superimposable, but there certainly are trends there. And there is a very sharp correlation between soda consumption and obesity, and also soda consumption in type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, a study just came out, tooth decay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not all of it due to overweight, some of it due to the enormous sugar content. And while the, most of these studies are correlational, uh, there's plenty of empirical evidence that shows that these things don't well, don't um, help with health, and the, the soda consumption going down is um, kind of. Uh, uh, equivalent, it kind of matches the falling off in the rise in rates of obesity and the leveling off and plateauing as soda consumption has gone down. Um, the obesity rates have going are 
leveling off. They're not going down yet, but they're leveling off. So the thumbs up win is on that one too. Um, and I'm very interested in advocacy, and there's plenty of advocacy uh, for drinking less soda. And all of this made this an exceptionally interesting project for me, uh, and it's a big book, it's 500 pages. <laughs> there was plenty to talk about. Now, um, the advocacy, the importance of advocacy is that the soda industry believes that public health advocacy is responsible for the decline in soda consumption. And there's plenty of evidence for that. Um, I first saw this in 2007 when I saw this interview in Advertising Age with a vice president uh, for marketing of Coca-Cola who talked about how obesity had become, you may think that obesity is a health problem. Uh, for the soda industry, obesity poses much more serious problems. Um, the Achilles heel is the discussion of obesity. It used to be that we didn't have to pay any attention to it at all. We could just blame it on personal responsibility. Today, every minute of our working lives is devoted to trying to figure out what we're going to do to stave off health advocates. And indeed, when Coca-Cola files its annual report to the Securities and Exchange Commission, in which they are obliged to list the main factors in society that might pose a threat to their profits, obesity has been the number one risk factor to Coca-Cola's profits for the last 10 years at least. Uh, and that's because of health advocates, the annoying, pesky health advocates. Uh, and they have had a great deal of difficulty dealing with the effects of advocacy. It's not just health advocates that are concerned about uh, the relationship of sodas to obesity. The business press is very aware of it, as well as this cover from about a year ago came out. And I think if the business press is doing covers like this, they get a thumbs up for that too. Um, and then, of course, I was totally aware that the soda industry was marketing to children and that they had made pledges to reduce their marketing to children, but unfortunately, advocates who have been tracking these kinds of things are uh, less than sanguine about the, uh, their keeping their promises. And in fact, most of the analyses show that if anything, they have increased marketing to children, just not in ways that are measurable through, the, through advertising agencies. And I've always been and long been concerned about the race and class issues of sodas in the United States. Uh, the, there's a chapter in the book that describes the uh, long history of efforts by the African American and Hispanic communities to get soda companies to advertise to them, to hire them, um, and to deal with them as they did with the rest of white society. And they succeeded in that only too admirably. And now we have a situation in which the burden of chronic disease is borne by low-income minorities, and the soda industry is using its connections with the minority community, in this case, to fight the soda tax in Richmond. And this, too, is coming under increasing uh, scrutiny as the New York Times, uh, during the period when the Bloomberg administration in New York was trying to put a cap on sodas, the New York Times had a major investigative piece looking at the relationship of the minority community to the soda industry because major African American and Hispanic organizations supported the soda industry against Mayor Bloomberg's soda cap. And these, they pointed out, were the very communities that were hit hardest um, by obesity and its consequences. Um, the most scrutiny that the practices of the soda industry have gotten came um, in August in the New York Times uh, when I was, this was, uh, for those of you who don't read the paper copy of the New York Times, this was um, a story that started in the right hand, in the left hand column, meaning it was the second most important story of the day, and then it continued on an entire inside page. 
Um, and this was an investigative report on Coca-Cola's funding of research investigators at several universities who uh, had created an organization called the Global Energy Balance Network, which was designed to uh, encourage people to be concerned about their activity levels and not to worry about what they ate. And one of the investigators was seen in a widely um, publicized video saying, everybody's always telling you uh, that you have to eat less junk food, drink fewer sodas, you don't have to do any of that, you just have to be a little bit more active. And this was so shocking to so many reporters that even Fox News was shocked <laughs> by this. Um, the result of that was a ridicule by cartoonists and others. We'd like to pay scientists to sing, um, and it's the surreal thing. And when you get ridiculed, you have to do something about it. This was a public relations disaster for Coca-Cola, uh, second only to the public relations disaster of New Coke of some years ago. Um, and the head of Coca-Cola International, Mutar Kent, um, wrote an editorial for the Wall Street Journal promising that we'll do better and saying that he had directed Sandy Douglas, the president of Coca-Cola North America, to publish a list on the website of everybody that they funded, all of the community organizations and all of the individuals that they funded. And happy as I was to see this list, I kind of cried because I wish it had come out while I was still writing the book. Um, it would have saved me so much trouble. But they did publish the list. Um, they, they absolutely did. And if you go on the Coca-Cola website and uh, type in transparency in the search box, you will get the transparency page. And if you want to have some fun, just click around and take a look at the list of organizations and the list of individuals. Um, a very entertaining group called Ninjas for Health, who I don't know anything about, has done an analysis of this list that's really pretty amazing. And it turns out Coca-Cola was funding a lot of dietitians. Um, a lot of academics and then medical fitness authors, chefs, and food people. Lots of individuals. Um, they also published the list of organizations, which I can't possibly show on a slide. You, you get to the list of organizations and you start scrolling down. And when you get to the point where you're tired of scrolling, you're only at the Ds. <laughs> Uh, because there are so many organizations. If you have an organization that's not getting money from Coca-Cola um, and you're worried about money, you could do that. So some of the big ones, the Ninjas for Health pointed out uh, that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics got about $700,000 from Coca-Cola, nearly $3 million to the American Academy of Pediatrics, and $3.5 million for the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians had this um, event a few years ago in which a lot of members of the academy burned their membership cards because they were so horrified uh, that, they, that they had taken money from Coca-Cola. And there's been a lot of internal dissent in these organizations. Um, and that has now resulted in Coca-Cola removing its sponsorship from those three and maybe others. Um, and one of the funny things about that is that the organizations are insisting to their members that they pulled out of the partnership, and Coca-Cola claims that they pulled out. But whichever one it was, um, it's all to the good that they're out of there. Many of the organizations are, are uh, represent the African-American community groups, Hispanics, athletic groups, youth groups, and university groups. It's kind of amazing to read the list. Um, and the, number, the amounts of money that these groups get um, are also quite public and, uh, the, and range from small amounts, a few thousand dollars, to millions. Um, so Coca-Cola is pulling out of that. That gets a thumbs up. 
So what did I get out of this? What did I learn that I didn't learn before? Well, I learned to think about the soda industry in a very different way. And I think the soda industry is a kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of situation. On the one hand, you have the public face of Coca-Cola in North America. This is Sandy Douglas, who's just a lovely man, seriously interested in public health, wants his company to be part of the solution to the obesity city problem not one of the not part of the um, not part of the problem. And I went to the world of Coca-Cola a few weeks ago with a couple of reporters um, in, in Atlanta. We had a, a wonderful time. And so this is the world of Coca-Cola. And the top uh, picture, you have to look really carefully, but that sort of funny blue thing in the middle of the windows is the logo of the American Cancer Society, whose headquarters is across the street. Um, and the lower one is an enormous troop of Tibetan monks who were going through at the time that we were there. It's kind of an, it's kind of an amazing place. And it's the public face of Coca-Cola. It's all about love and happiness and family values. <clears throat> Much of it very, very touching. Um, and then you pay $16 and you're advertised to for the entire time that you're there. And you exit through an enormous gift shop. It was fun. Um, so, uh, that, so that's the part that is the great face of Coca-Cola. What Coca-Cola says it's doing to deal with obesity is um, it's promoting bottled water. It owns bottled water companies. Soda, the soda companies own bottled water companies. Bottled water is up. We can argue about the environmental implications, and I've got chapters on that. Um, but at least from a public health standpoint, water is better than soda. The other thing they're doing is they're producing soda in mini cans and putting huge amounts of advertising money into advertising the mini cans, which you can get with your name on it. Um, and the great thing about the mini cans from the standpoint of the company is they cost more. Um, so if you're buying the mini cans, you're going to be paying as much as you would be paying for larger portions. And uh, Coca-Cola did quite well last year on the, min on the, on the mini cans. Um, even though sales of the full sugar sodas are down. So that's good. On the other hand, we have Mr. Hyde and um, the person who took the, this photograph is in the audience. Thank you, Gael. That was really nice of you. I love this photograph. Um, this is Mark Perchik, who was speaking at Berkeley during the Berkeley Tax Initiative and um, put up this terrific slide, which I have just stolen, um, on the comparison between big tobacco and big food. Um, obviously, soda is not tobacco, but we still see the tobacco industry hiring front groups, uh, looking for preemptive legislation, buying friends, buying politicians, and having a national strategy about how to protect its interests. This is the Mr. Hyde part. It's the part of the soda industry um, that gets involved with exceedingly right-wing conservative um, organizations like ALEC, uh, which it doesn't fund anymore, but used to, to try to write legislation that would protect its interests. It's the astonishing amount of money that it spends on lobbying. Uh, this, is, this is lobbying for Pepsi, Coca-Cola, and the American Beverage Association. And the big peaks that you see in 2009 and 2010 were the extraordinary amounts of money that the soda industry put into lobbying against a federal soda tax law that was being considered that year. Guess what? But Congress didn't do one. Um, and then shades of the tobacco industry, they, they follow the tobacco industry playbook. And they start by attacking the science. This was a full page ad during the period of the Bloomberg soda cap fight. Uh, are sugar, soda and sugar sweetened beverages driving obesity? Of course not, according to facts assembled by the American Beverage Association. Next, you defend self-regulation. Where have we heard that before? We've reduced beverage calories in school by 88%, even though our logos are still all over the schools. And then you attack the critic, and I love showing this because this is Mayor Bloomberg, um, a, a, 
an advertisement um, put in during the soda cap fight from the Center for Consumer Freedom. And Bloomberg, fortunately, uh, has a sense of humor. And when uh, reporters asked him what he thought about this ad, he said, oh, that dress. I would never wear that dress. It's so unflattering. <laughs> no. So uh, yeah, the, the politics. And then when all of that fails and your sales are still going down, you move your um, marketing overseas. And this was a, uh, a graph showing what was happening between 2002 and 2007. Um, sales in the United States were down. Sales all over the rest of the world were up. And that's not surprising, because the amounts of money that are going into marketing sodas overseas are breathtaking. Um, here's one of my favorite comments about that from the Wall Street Journal three years ago. India has 1.2 billion people, but not enough of them drink Coke. Pepsi is going to invest $5.5 billion in India by 2020. We've only scratched the surface. Uh, Coca-Cola has moved into Myanmar, one of the last holdouts. It's going to put $4 billion in China um, from 2015 on. And Pepsi and Suntory have a partnership to crack Vietnam's beverage market. Um, and then my favorite is Africa. Uh, Coca-Cola raises its African investment to $17 billion. This came out in August. And that means that between 2010 and 2020, Coca-Cola will have spent $29 billion on marketing sodas, building bottling plants, and setting up marketing in Africa. Just think about that for a minute. Think about what, tw this is billion, not million. $29 billion, think about what that could do in development costs. Um, so there's something wrong with this picture. But fortunately, we have advocacy. And we have extraordinary advocacy around soda issues, much of it in this room. Um, and I don't have to tell people in Berkeley about soda advocacy. What amazes me about it is how much of it there is, how diverse it is, and um, how um, clearly stated. Soda sucks. I like that one. Or, kill, or Killer Coke, which is a very entertaining organization. That's a good one. So that one gets a thumbs up, too. Um, and part of the point of doing this book was not to get everybody involved in soda advocacy, but to use soda as an, as an example of advocacy for a healthier and more sustainable food movement. The kinds of activities that work for sodas will work for other aspects of the food movement as well. And so I wanted to situate this in a much, much wider Occupy uh, the food system kind of approach to this. Um, one of the uh, points that seemed really impressive in looking at the way advocacy was done around soda issues was that it followed the playbook for uh, the most successful advocacy in social movements in the past. Um, it was as if everybody trained with Saul Alinsky, Obama trained with Saul Alinsky. Uh, and the, um, the kinds of ways in which this was done in the most successful examples has worked really well. And what is the most successful example in the United States? It was the Berkeley soda tax. Um, yeah. <laughs> So let, let me congratulate you for, for doing that and for doing it really, really, really well. And I think from an outsider's standpoint, um, looking at it, the two things that, that were done really, really well in the Berkeley Soda Tax Initiative were, first of all, the framing. The framing was brilliant. Um, Berkeley versus Big Soda. Not big, not this is going to help your health and prevent type 2 diabetes. Berkeley versus Big Soda. So that when the soda industry put all those advertisements in the BART station, um, everybody could see that this is the way Big Soda operates. 
It was just obvious. And of course, the other part was the community organizing that went on around this. And um, my understanding is that there was canvassing and community organizing in every single community in Berkeley. And the result was that the community stood together as one and passed the soda tax. And uh, people are going to be looking. And oh, and the Bloomberg Foundation money didn't hurt. Um, the Bloomberg Foundation money is important, and it's a big issue in advocacy because who's going to fund it? And of course, there the oh, positive, the big positive example is the Mexican soda tax, um, which against all odds passed about a year ago and has withstood all attempts to weaken it and destroy it. There was an immediate attempt to weaken it, and the tax was only half the level that the Mexican soda tax advocates wanted. Um, but the, it did work. There's evidence that it cut soda sales. And then recently, in the last couple of weeks, when the soda industry really moved in and tried to get Mexico to scale back the soda tax, um, there was a lot of accusation that Congress was caving in to the soda industry. And they finally, the legislators finally <laughs> voted to keep it. So that's an enormous victory. And if you want to know what it was about, you can look at yesterday's um, Guardian, which had a very, very long analytical article about uh, what made this, the Mexican soda tax work. But I think the answer to that is obvious, too. It was just really skilled advocacy with an enormous amount of political savvy, um, community organizing, clear targeting of messages, uh, some of the best advocates I've ever seen at work there. And it didn't hurt that Bloomberg Foundation put $16 million into that campaign. Um, <laughs> So um, I'm in Berkeley, where there's a university that does a lot of critical thinking. And I'm very, very well aware uh, that there is an enormous critique of the food movement that's been published in a lot of books um, and, there, and a lot of newspaper articles. And that critique is that the food movement has no real power. Um, that it's competing for scarce resources, that it's focused on consumption and yummy food, not changing the system, which is what we really want to do, that it's elitist and per perpetuates race and class inequities, and that it's not going to produce any lasting change. I think that's a really pessimistic view of what's going on, and I don't see it that way at all. Um, I tend to be optimistic about these things, but I also think that there's an enormous amount of evidence for having a glass half full way of looking at this. So much has happened and so many gains have occurred of which the decline in soda sales is only the tip of the iceberg that I think everybody should be just enormously heartened uh, by the kind of work that's going on and be inspired to take on other challenges. Um, and there are lots and lots of other challenges. There are other challenges on the yummy food side, and I'm not opposed to having yummy food. Um, that's the voting with your fork uh, part of the uh, of the political advocacy part. Uh, the voting with your fork is make is what's making the difference. People are not buying sodas to the same extent, and of course there was the political part that set that up. But all of these kinds of movements or mini movements are having an effect and making for a much healthier, um, better, more delicious, and more sustainable food system. And then, of course, I think it's critically important that we engage with the politics here. And if we want real change, lasting change, um, and change that's going to make a difference for everybody, we've got to vote with our votes as well as voting with our forks. And this is my very, very long list of areas that I think need work, need advocacy, need organizing, need political activity. And I hope you'll all get busy on them. And that is the message of at least my last two books, Eat, Drink, Vote, and Soda Politics. That's what Soda Politics is really about. Um, and I thank you very, very much for the opportunity to tell you about it. Thanks. <laughs> This is no. working. This one is.
I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> okay, now it's working. Is it working? Okay. No. Yeah, yeah it's Is working. It? So uh, we have about. I'm going to look to Anne. Where's Anne? About 15 minutes for questions, and I was going to kick it off because I wanted to sort of hone in a, a little bit with Marion on this. The question of uh, equity and communities of color, in certainly in California, leaders in the state, um, like the Latino Coalition in the legislature, who uniformly refuse to support state legislation, either on warning bills mm -hmm. or on soda taxes. Mm -hmm. And the argument in communities of color that the industry has really been supportive of the, their communities, mm -hmm. both in terms mm -hmm. of bottlers and mm -hmm. uh, handlers and truckers and schools. Mm -hmm. And breaking that allegiance has been very challenging. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure it's just about the money. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you have some thoughts mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I do. And I have a chapter about it in the book <laughs> where I discuss it in some detail. I mean, if you go to Coca-Cola World, uh, you're, the first thing you have to do is you have to watch a video. And all I can say about that video is there isn't a dry eye in the house afterwards because it is so incredibly touching. Um, and the two hard-boiled reporters that I were with were all kind of wiping our eyes at the end of it. It was impossible to watch without getting teary. Coca-Cola has been brilliant about appealing to people's emotions. The history of that is not so pretty. Um, it's really not. Martin Luther King, on the night before he was assassinated, gave a speech um, in which he exhorted his followers to boycott Coca-Cola because they weren't hiring members of the community. Um, so there was this history of um, boycotts, of demonstrations, of all kinds of things to insist that Coca-Cola and PepsiCo hire people from the minority community. And of course they did. And once they did, they became entrenched. And they became not only financially entrenched, but emotionally intent, uh, entrenched um, because of the employment involved in it. Uh, it's not a pretty story, and there are several books um, that I quote from and refer to that tell the story. It's um, And there are still. Um, class action suits within both of these companies to try to get them to treat their <clears throat> minority em, uh, employees fairly. It's a very, very difficult situation. And in the, um, in the Bloomberg soda cap situation, which I'm much more familiar with because I live in New York, um, I was fascinated by the role of these big minority organizations in supporting the soda company. But in the book, I quote a, a leader of either the New York State or New York City NAACP. I'm not, I can't remember which it was, um, in which he said, nobody ever came and talked to us. You know, he said, well, nobody talked to us. They just assumed and that was exactly what happened in that soda cap. It was just dumped. Um, nobody talked to us. And I thought, well, OK, he just gave an enormous opening. How about talking to people? It might help. And for sure, the Berkeley folks learned that lesson, huh? So let's take some questions from the audience. And I think if I have time, one from this section, middle, and, and that side. So are there any questions over here? Or arguments. I'll take arguments. Yeah, come on. Here's a question right there. Um, I've been following the soda warning label fight and the, the tax fight as well. And it seems like the coalitions haven't quite aligned themselves. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about sort of the nuanced politics of whether you push for a soda tax or a soda warning label at the state level or both at the same time. I don't know what the, you know. I don't know enough about the politics. I think the um, you know advocacy by the book means that you have a specific problem that you want to address. You have an agreed upon strategy for addressing it. You um, do everything you can to get allies 
for that particular strategy. You have a target for the strategy. You know exactly who you need to deal with, who's in a position to give you the, what, what you want. You go for it. If it doesn't work, you try something else. It would be nice if everybody was, were on the same page, but that's not how politics works. So you do the best you can. You're going to have to, oh, good, Anne. You'll get your exercise. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's important to um, point out that that d declining consumption curve got made up for, for a long time in rising sports drinks consumption and so forth. Oh, and, not, and not as much as you would think. Well, increasingly in the mm. coffee drinks, which aren't even being brought mm. into the sugary beverage mm. definition. So it's just an important thing to mm. realize. Cons the consumption curve does drop, but it's a, l a lot later, actually, than the slides were showing. And, that, and I realize you didn't want to write a thousand page book that included sports drinks and all these oh, other Well, actually, products. they're in the book. <laughs> yeah. They are. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't want to give, a, I didn't wanna give an hour and a half yeah. talk. <laughs> but, you know I'm a major advocate and, and active person around uh, soda taxation, but increasingly, particularly after meeting with uh, folks from the Mexican government uh, uh, last month, I'm, and having done some research in San Francisco in our uh, low-income communities of color, I'm increasingly concerned about the ethics around uh, introducing tax, taxes in very poor populations where there's no free access to clean water. And mm -hmm. particularly when the companies are pricing uh, bottled water often higher. a third higher. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there isn't a staged need here that we first focus on clean water access or, I mean, I, I realize mm. you, can, you can garner the tax money and put it into clean water and San Francisco, the board is, is doing that right now. They're just trying to get Doesn't clean water. Doesn't San Francisco water. have clean water? No, and actually, you know, what's scary is no. uh, a colleague of mine who's doing water testing in schools is finding even in the San Francisco school district, the, t the water's not clean. And so I think we really need to be thinking about this issue, particularly in, in places like Mexico, where there's such, that people are drinking these drinks because yeah, they don't have access to water. My understanding was that the original tax proposal was linked to, in the same way that it was linked here, um, that the original tax proposal was linked to clean water in schools and clean water systems. One of the problems is that that's not happening. So they're working on that, I think. But thanks for bringing that up. That's an important point. That's a great thing to advocate for. Good. Um, I have a, s changing the topic slightly, but it is sort of related to ethics, I suppose. There's a um, vast biomedical literature demonstrating how so-called overweight is not necessarily an indicator of poor health, mm -hmm. nor is thinness a reliable measure of good health. And I personally find a lot of sort of fat phobia and body shaming um, in much of this anti-soda rhetoric and imagery, like some of the advertisements you showed. So building from that observation, I'm wondering if there's a way in which, um, well, I, I sort of sense that there's a way in which stigmatization or shaming of a certain product in turn stigmatizes and shames those who consume it. Um, and when it comes to dietary changes in particular, shame has been demonstrated to be counterproductive at best. So I'm wondering what you think about the sort of, the potential for divisiveness or the counterproductivity of anti-soda efforts that are sort of producing and perpetuating this kind of stigmatization, um, especially given your, uh, the connections you made between soda and sort of broader food movement goals around mm -hmm. social justice. Yeah, it's an important issue. And the, um, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, there are real public health issues involved here. And it's too bad we can't do public health without having 
stigmatization, and there's certainly plenty of evidence for stigmatization. And fortunately, some of the really important, one of the some of the really important groups that, like the Rudd Center, uh, particularly, has taken that on as something that it's focusing on, and other groups should be doing that too. Thanks for bringing that up. Hi, uh, Martin Bork, Ecology Center. Um, just as an active member of the uh, Berkeley versus Big Soda campaign, we um, anticipated a large outpouring from the public health community, which is very rich and diverse here in the Bay Area. And what we saw was um, a lot of organizations who are willing to discuss the issue, promote the topics, give us information. Um, but when it came to actually putting boots on the ground, which is what we needed, mm -hmm. there was a real reluctance um, mm -hmm. with notable exceptions. Um, but just you know, from within the academy or from the advocacy world that operates you know, within legislative environments, mm -hmm. which is very different than can, you know, campaign, elect, uh, ballot measure campaigns, um, it was very difficult to, to kind of get that translation from the public health community. I'm wondering if you, you could speak to that, if that's something that's happened in other communities or if that's was um, unique to this in our fight with Big yeah. Soda. I don't know what the situation was here. I can tell you that in talking to my classes, um, which have food studies, nutrition, public health, public policy students in them, that there is a reluctance among everybody to put feet on the ground. Um, the uh, politics is like that. You know, you don't really expect me to go out and engage in this. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do with this book, is to encourage people to um, put feet on the ground. If we don't do it, who else is going to do it? The system isn't going to change if people aren't asking for the system to change. You talk to people in Washington about what makes, what drives them. They're not talking about money. They're talking about the number of letters that they get from their constituents. Um, so I think public health people aren't trained to do real activism. And part of what's astonishing about that is that public health um, program planning and evaluation, which is a public health course, is about community organizing. But nobody ever does it. Um, it's, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to go into communities and tell them what to do. You're supposed to go into communities, ask them what they need, and help them get what they need. But that's not how it's done in practice. So there's a gap there, and I think the public health schools should be teaching advocacy. Um, and I think UC School of Public Health is teaching advocacy. I think we have time for one more, one more question. Hi, um, so I'm a food core service member over at Oakland Unified and yeah, it's pretty cool. I love food court. <laughs> Me too. Um, we have a really robust wellness policy that we just uh, put into effect fairly recently. Um, did all sorts of cool things like limiting sugary snacks in the classroom, no soda, all these sorts of things. And um, a big mission of Food Corps is to bring education about nutrition to children because adults are a lot harder to educate. Um, and so... <laughs> Uh, kids are just more willing to experience and try new things, and I'm wondering what you think the best group to target this sort of education is at, because you wrote a book for adults, but, you know, do you think that adults are the I best way to carry this message? I didn't pay her to ask this question. I just want you to know that. I have a chapter in the book on how to get kids to advocate. No. <laughs> So it has exercises and things that you can do, and at the end of it, your kids will make your life miserable, I hope. <laughs> no. I also encourage you to look at Youth Speaks, which is a local organization. Oh. great work with young people, and you know, they are really becoming the advocates of the future. 
Yeah, they have fabulous videos, and I couldn't put links to all of those in the book. I couldn't put URLs in the book at all because they disappear. But on my website, foodpolitics.com, on the page for Soda Politics, there's a file of all of the videos that I came across organized by chapter. Um, so for the children's advocacy chapter, the Youth Speaks videos are right in there. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks.